When most people think about the natural world around us, they think of animals being on top of the food chain and plants being underneath them. Although, there are plants that turn the tables on animals, and these are meat-eating plants. And today, I'm going to show you a few of them. What I have down here might be the most recognizable plants people think of when they think of carnivorous plants. These are the Venus flytraps. I'm going to zoom in so we can see them a little bit better. These are Venus flytraps. And we have four different Venus flytraps here that look very different from each other. But it's important to keep in mind that these are all one species with just phenotypic differences. It's sort of similar to us humans. We're all one species, but we can have different hair colors and skin tones and eye colors. And this is the same case with the Venus flytrap. They're all one species, but each individual plant can have a different characteristic to it. So some are thinner, some are shorter and fatter, some have bigger traps, some have smaller traps, and some can have an abundance of pigmentation like this Akhairiu, which has a lot of reddish and purple pigmentation in the leaves. Now, although these look like a plant from a tropical jungle somewhere, they're actually temperate plants. They come from an area in between North and South Carolina. And their native habitat is sort of a swampland or a bogland and they don't grow in soaking wet soil like most people think. Now, their native habitat is kept moist, but it's not like these plants grow right on the edge of the river or a lake and have their roots soaking in the water all the time. And that's actually why most people kill these plants when they try and grow them as house plants. It's because they keep it too wet. So they grow in moist soil, but not in soaking wet soil. Now, since these come from North America, they're temperate plants and they grow dormant in the fall. And what we see happening is actually some of the older leaves are turning yellow and black and dying off. And in the winter time, eventually what can happen if it's, if it's kept cold enough is that the new growth starts to grow shorter and stubbier, which is actually why we have two different types of leaves here. These are the summer leaves and these are the winter leaves that are growing shorter and fatter. And eventually what may happen to all these plants is that about a third to a half of the leaves may turn black and die off. So probably the most well-known aspect of this plant is its ability to catch insects. And this is sort of reminding us of kind of like a mouth because of the shape of the leaves. And the way the plant catches insects, as we can see if we zoom in on this one, it caught a fly a little while ago. And I'm going to try and show you how these plants catch the insects. Now since it's autumn and we're going into dormancy, they might not be as active, but basically how the plants catch the insect is they have three trigger hairs on each side of the leaf here. So they have three on this side and three hairs on this side uh, on the inside of this mouth. And they've developed a way to tell between debris that might fall on them or raindrops and insects. Basically, how you trigger these plants is that you have to trigger one hair and then after a few seconds you trigger a second hair or a different hair and what happens is then it closes. So it sort of developed this method of being able to tell between sticks or debris and insects because it would waste too much energy trapping and eating stuff that it can't digest, like raindrops and rocks or debris. Now, it ate that stick because I triggered one hair and I triggered another hair in a succession. Now, normally if the wind blew the stick over into the plant, this wouldn't happen, but it's because I specifically triggered each hair, kind of how an insect would trigger the hairs, walking around inside the trap, hitting one, waiting a few seconds and hitting another. And when the trap closes around the insect, what it 
it starts doing is secreting digestive enzymes. So then the bug gets coated in these enzymes, and the enzymes start breaking the insect apart, and then the plant can take all those liquefied insect juices and absorb them and use them for growth. And the reason the plant developed this is because it grows in these bog lands where the soil is really poor in nutrients. So in a way to supplement its nutritional needs, since its roots can't get any nutrients from the soil, it developed this method of catching insects and digesting them so it can have additional nutrients uh, in addition to the sunlight which provides it with photosynthesis. What I have here are three examples of pitcher plants. Now these are North American pitcher plants and when we think of North American pitcher plants this Dana's Delight is a common example of one. I'm going to zoom in so you can see them a little bit better. So when we typically think of the North American pitcher plants, this is what we think of. They're these long leaves that have rolled into tubes and on the inside of these tubes there's lots of hairs. Now the way all these pitcher plants trap and digest insects is that they secrete a sweet smelling uh, liquid on the rim of the pitcher or underneath this hood and when the insect comes by and tries to find its next meal it'll end up crawling down to the pitcher trying to find a new source of f uh, food and when it crawls down here it gets stuck because what these saracenias all have are hairs that point downwards and they go down, 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 all the way down into the tube. And when the insect crawls down into it, it can't go back up because all the hairs are pointing down. And eventually what happens is the insect either dies of starvation or suffocates. And then there's digestive enzymes secreted inside this tube, which will digest the bug. Now, these are not filled with water all except for one species, which is the Saracenia purpurea. And this is a bit shorter and fatter than most typical pitcher plants. And if you were to look in here, you'd see a little pool of water. What happens is that, like most Saracenias, insects will come in here, they're looking for a drink or some nectar, and when they fall in, they'll drown. And on the lip here, there's lots of these hairs pointing downwards, so the animal has an easy time going down, but it's not going to be able to crawl back up. And then what's worse is on the inside here, it's really slippery. So when the animal falls in, it pretty much is doomed in a pool of water. Now what this plant has is some digestive enzymes because like all other saracenias it needs a way to break down and digest the meal but what these plants also have is a lot of bacteria growing inside the pools of water and that's sort of symbiotic because it helps the plant break down the insects and be able to digest it this is a parrot pitcher plant and this one's interesting it's really young so it's nowhere near the size it's going to be but the reason this one is interesting is because it grows in an area uh, down south that's prone to lots of flooding so this plant can actually be submerged underwater for a few days when the floods come and the way it traps the insects or it has these hoods that look a little bit like a parrot hence the name and there's an opening and the bug will crawl down inside and the hairs will keep pushing it down down towards the middle where it will suffocate now an interesting aspect of these saracenias is since they can go underwater they can trap uh, insects or animals that live underwater when people have cut open some of these pitchers they found stuff like tadpoles living inside so this plant is a little bit interesting because not only does it eat insects there's some fish and young frogs and it eats as well once it gets bigger now this plant is a butterwort it's similar to sundews what this plant has is really sticky leaves and you might not be able to see it because it looks sort of like a succulent that you might find 
Now these plants, they grow in a wide range. They come from parts of South America, they come from Europe, they come from all over the world. And basically how these plants work is that there is tiny, tiny little hairs on the leaves, similar to a sundew, but you could barely see them. And it secretes little dew droplets all over the leaf. And when a tiny insect comes by, sort of like a fruit fly or something around that size, it'll get stuck. It's not that effective of a carnivorous plant because it can't catch anything too big since it relies on the adhesion to the leaves. Now, these plants, once the insect goes on the leaf and it gets stuck, it'll slowly get suffocated by all the goo on top of these leaves. And then, once it dies, the glands on the leaf will secrete enzymes digesting the insect. So these are another cool example of carnivorous plants. These next plants are my favorite carnivorous plants. These are the sundews. Now what we have here are three different species of sundews. Sundews are very diverse, they come from all over the world, and each species can have a different leaf shape and different colorations. We have pretty much just tropical sundews here. This one is a capensis, an albino form of the capensis, which comes from South Africa, and these two are Drosera adelae and Drosera spatulata, and they both come from Australia. This one's Drosera spatulata, Fraser's Island form. Now they all trap insects in much the same way. If we zoom in, we can see all these tiny little dew droplets that are on the leaves, and these are really sticky. They're similar to the butterwort. What happens is that when an insect comes by and touches one of these leaves, it'll get stuck. You can see some of the dew is getting stuck and pulling on my finger. And when the bug, either from a fruit fly or a mosquito or something very small which can't struggle its way out, will get stuck and entangled in all these hairs. Now these uh, sundews can slightly curl around the bug, and this is most apparent in the capensis. The entire leaf will move and close in on the bug, and the reason it'll do that is to get more of these hairs in contact with the bug, which in turn will get the bug more stuck by covering it more in that sticky glue. And then there's glands on the inside of the leaf on the surface which will secrete enzymes and digest the insect like all the other carnivorous plants. So once again these are the sundews, these are my favorite plant and you can find them all over the world. These Nepenthes are the last example of carnivorous plants that I have. They're tropical pitcher plants and they come from an area of the world sort of around southern Asia Australia and the islands in between Southern Asia and Australia like Borneo. And in my opinion, these are the most deadly carnivorous plants there are out there. The way that they kill animals is by using these pitchers they have at the ends of their leaves. And uh, this is a Nepenthes miranda, so you can see it has some pretty big pitchers. And this one also has a small pitcher down here. This is a Nepenthes ventrata, it's a hybrid. And this tiny little pitcher is the only one it has right now, but eventually all the leaves will grow pitchers like that. And basically there's sort of a misconception on how these plants catch and kill insects. When we look at these pitchers, we sort of think that they get filled with rain and then the insect just kind of falls inside the pitcher and drowns. But actually the liquid inside these pitchers isn't just water. Basically, the Nepenthes produces this liquid meant for catching and killing insects before this pitcher even opens. As they're developing, they're kind of like a little bud, and then finally this little flap up here opens up and exposes the pitcher, and the liquid is already inside. What the liquid is made out of is basically a mixture of uh, enzymes and biopolymers, and it's really efficient at killing insects because basically, when the insect falls inside the pitcher, the biopolymers coat it in sort of a 
liquid that's sort of sticky but also slippery at the same time so the insect kind of struggles around and gets stuck to itself but also it's really slippery inside the pitcher so the insect can't crawl up anymore and then all the enzymes in the liquid start digesting the bug so it's pretty much instant death once the insect falls in here and they also secrete nectar around the rim of the plant and underneath this hood so when insects fly by or crawl around the pitcher and try and find their next meal of nectar, they'll slip or fall into the pitcher and then the pitcher will start digesting it. And they're really deadly. They can kill insects faster than most insecticides that are on the market today. And there's certain varieties of these pitcher plants that get really, really big pitchers and some people have even found stuff like birds and frogs and rats inside the pitcher. So if there's a plant which would be the most carnivorous plant in the world, it would be a Nepenthes because not only does it eat insects like all the other plants I've shown you, it's also been killing birds and frogs and rats. Now these Nepenthes are epiphytes and what that means is they grow on top of another plant but they're not parasitic. And when we find them in the wild, they're basically growing on top of trees and they'll find a little crack or crevice inside the tree that's sort of hollowed out and maybe has some accumulated leaf litter and wood chips inside of it. And so when they grow in nature, that little crevice doesn't really have much nutrients to provide because basically none of these Nepenthes grow in soil. And so it's pretty much like all the other carnivorous plants that I've shown you today. Their natural habitat doesn't offer them any nutrients to supplement their photosynthesis. So basically all these plants were getting sunlight and water, but they didn't have enough nutrients to support themselves. And they developed all these adaptations from the closing traps to these pitchers to sticky leaves to catch insects and digest them because all of these carnivorous plants have to eat insects because there's no other way for them to get nutrients.